then Friday is districts. Everybody. We're so glad to see you. Let's begin our worship this morning and stand with us and sing. church. So glad you're here this morning. I pray that uh, God will speak to your hearts. We are uh, just having the opportunity to worship, and I pray that as God speaks, you'll listen and follow and be obedient. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the beauty of it. Father, being able to see the sun shining and having the health to get up and come into a place that you have provided. Uh, Father, as your church gathers, I pray that you will hear from our hearts, that God, you would indeed be worshiped and that you might speak to us. I pray, Father, that as you do, we might follow in joy and confidence, Father, being obedient, and that God, you might lead us and guide us and direct us. So have your way in our life today and help us to glorify and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. This morning, I want to invite uh, Bob Bertels up here. He's from uh, Vision uh, of Hope, African Vision of Hope, and so he's just going to come and let you know how how, how pleased he is of just having uh, you uh, on, his, uh, on his team as he serves. So, Bob? Yeah. Well, thank you, Pastor Duane, for having me today. It's a, it's a privilege to be here, a privilege to see faces of men and women who are partners with African Vision of Hope and who have sponsored children. It was about 25 years ago that I sat in a congregation just about this size, the First Baptist Church of Maryville, Maryville, Illinois, and our worship pastor raised his hand and said, hey, we're having some boys from Africa come and sing, but we have to have some host families. So we had five kids, and my mom and my, mom. my wife and I decided that, well, we'll take a couple of them, and we'll be a host family for the night. Our job was to feed them on Saturday night, sing Saturday night, bring them to church Sunday morning, and that's exactly what we did. We raised our hands, said we are, we're willing to do this. Well, we didn't know raising our hand would change our life, but it does. 
And 25 years later, we now have over 4,000 children in our school systems in Zambia, Africa. So what my message to you is very simple. Life is too short, your calling is too great, and our God is too good to use your resources on things that do not have eternal value. I stumbled across somebody, a couple people who sponsor kids, and let me just say a word to you. Um, when we get off of the bus and we visit some of our schools, we're mobbed by kids, right? We're just mobbed by kids. And uh, eventually, you'll come down to two or three young boys or girls, and uh, they'll say something like this, did my sponsor come? And normally, I have to say, well, I don't know who's your sponsor. And they'll pull out a piece of paper that's been folded and unfolded a 100 times. And they'll point to the name of the letter that's written, and I'll say, yeah, I know them. But they didn't come today, but they probably sent you another letter. And they'll say something like this. Just tell them I'm praying for them. Because when you sponsor a child, it gives them hope. And hope is a very, very powerful force. Thank you for having me. I think there are many times in our lives where we feel that we're just kind of wandering wandering around as strangers in this world and you know as as we just heard um you know that is a little different now than maybe it was years ago where um a letter can travel in a matter of days around the world um but we rejoice in the fact that knowing that if we know our lord and savior those that have passed on or those that may be across the world from us that we will see um in heaven one day so join us in singing wayfaring stranger and then into um, my Jesus after I read scripture of the day. <laughs> so Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, and Lord knows I'm going to need that mercy today, uh, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made up alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved and reflect us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Story in 
concert with the blood wash band I want to wear a crown of glory when I get home to that good Tell you about my Jesus, and then my Jesus changed. 
Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Maybe seated. You can't get excited with that song. We need to talk. Amen. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2. The wonder of grace. We preach about it, we sing about it, we teach it. And folks, it just never gets old. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is such a great thing that we just can't can't talk about it enough. The very first verse of chapter 2 speaks truckloads to those who know Christ as their Savior. It says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Amen. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. In sin. Paul writing to the Corinthians says, And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Amen. You were dead in your sins. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit of God has worked a work in you by God's amazing grace. Grace, the wonder of of grace over and over we read about this wonderful thing called grace if you've never thought about it before i hope by the conclusion of this message that you'll know the lord of grace and that grace would have its way in your life you see as we go through this first 10 verses we're going to find that that grace has everything to do with our salvation. I think sometimes we have a tendency to be saved by grace and then think that somehow we can live without it. And Paul, right, the Galatians said, who has bewitched you? I mean, how can you possibly think that? The same grace that saves you is the grace that keeps you. It's the grace that moves you forward. It's the grace that supplies your heart with all that is needed that you might have joy, that you might have peace. It's the grace of God that we can even sit together this morning and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God's grace. Oh, the wonder of grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Let me read that for your hearing, and I want you to think about this wondrous grace. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom we also had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he hath loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves It is the gift of God, not of works, lest we should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
Oh, the wonder of God's grace. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you this morning. For with a heart that is humbled by your grace. Those who know your son, when we were walking through this world as sinners, had nothing to look forward to in eternity. And yet your grace broke through the darkness. Your son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, spoke to our hearts of our greatest need as sinners. Drew us to yourself and gave us the faith to believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. That we might have that wonderful, wonderful fruit of grace, eternal life. This morning, I pray that you might help us to realize just a portion of this wonder. God, we'll probably never understand it this side of standing in front of you, the magnitude of that grace, and yet you pour it out on us. Grant us, Father, to see, to know, to have the hope that grace brings. And may we be willing to pass that on to others that they might see, hear, and believe and know the wonder of grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in order to understand the wonder of this grace, we really, we first need to know who we are or what we were uh, in this, this realm of grace. And so there is, there is a past, a present, and a future arena that grace works and that we really need to, to know about. So we look first at what it was or what we were before grace was applied. Verses 1 through 3 uh, speaks to that. And what it speaks very clearly is that without the grace of God, we are dead. We are dead, the walking dead nonetheless, but dead. We have nothing which we can give to God, nothing that is fruit in our lives. Verse 1 says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. One pastor by the name of Johnny Creason said, when you're a sinner, you do not need recitation. You need a resurrection because we are dead, depraved, and doomed. Dead. Dead in our trespasses, in our sins. All who have never known Christ are lost and they are dead in their sins. Oh, they're, they're breathing and they can think, but in the eternal aspect, they are dead. All are dead. And let me tell you something. One corpse cannot be more dead than another. It may be different in the different stages of decay, but dead is dead. Amen? You can't be any more dead than dead is. But it is interesting that within the world of, of mankind that many are in different stages of decay. The child molester may be more decayed, so to speak, and decomposed outwardly than the lost nurse working in the hospital. But dead is dead. And Christ makes it clear in the scriptures. Paul, in writing to Ephesians, says, listen, you were dead in trespasses and sin. The two words, trespasses and sin, make it all inclusive. The idea of trespasses really speaks to those things that we, we don't know about. We do unwittingly. We don't, we don't think about. It, it, it sins that sort of pass right on through and we don't take any notice of. But when he adds that word sin to us, this word speaks to those things that we knowingly and, perfect, and purposely commit. In other words, it's everything, folks. Sin of all sorts, of all kinds, we are dead in them. They, they killed us. We are, we are decaying out in this world with only one thing to look forward to in the future. Outside of the grace of God, we are all dead in our trespasses and sins, period. And folks, let me tell you something. There is no difference in sin as far as God's concerned. We're dead in it. And you may say, well, I'm not a child molester, and I'm not a, a murderer of women and a murderer of men, and I don't transport folks over borders to sell them into slavery. I mean, the worst that can be said of me is, that, is that, I, that I lie. And we don't like to say I'm a liar, but how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? I ask you how many times you have to commit adultery to be an adulterer. Once, <laughs> let me tell you, sin is sin, and every one of us is dead in our sins. Outside of the grace of God and the working of his grace in our hearts, we are 
dead. But it goes even deeper than that because as the quote goes, we are depraved. We're deprived. Let me, let me start in verse 2. Wherein, in time past, in other words, he's talking to a group of Christians saying, this is what it was like before grace. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. That word conversation means our lifestyle. In times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind. He said, listen, this is how we live. Prior to grace being active in our lives, we lived our life for ourselves. Sin had us under control. Uh, and it's amazing when you tell that, people say, no, sin doesn't control me. Oh, yes, it does. Let me tell you something. It's, it controls you so much that you're dead. <laughs> you have no hope. You're deprived that the very nature of our essence is the fact that we are and cannot do anything to please a holy, righteous God. Our works, regardless of how the world might see them, mean nothing to God outside a work of grace in our hearts. You can be the best man that the world thinks should be and still be dead in your sin and depraved because of our relationship to God or our lack of relationship to God. We are all depraved. We live in accordance with the course of this world. In other words, we live this fleshly life by the world's standards and the world's values. Now, you may say, well, I don't... I don't to use left and right just as an example. I don't believe what those folks on the left live, no, but tell you what, the ones on the right sometimes are just as bad. And as far as Scripture goes, they're just as depraved and just as dead in trespasses and sins. Because they don't make their standard God, they don't make their standard His Word, they don't make their standard the ultimate standard, being the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, whether we consider ourselves left or right, outside of an act of grace, we are still dead in our sins and our trespasses, and we are just as depraved as anybody else that walks this world. We live according to the prince of the power of the air. Our flu influence comes from Satan and his horde of demons. You may never see one. You may never be possessed by one. You may never have one that actually comes up and touches you, but you are living according to their standard. Why? Because their standard is anything that is opposed to God is what I believe in. And there are many sitting in our pews today who hold the standard of the prince of the air as their standard and not Christ. Depraved. We are without any good in the eyes of God because of our life. We live a life that is defiant or disobedient to God and his will. It's a spirit of sorts if you might want to take it that way. It's a nature that wants its own way. It's influenced by the world's idea of me, myself, and I, 62 years old, been blessed to all but two of those years to live within the borders, and I'll take that back, all but four of those years to live within the borders of the United States of America. And let me tell you something, we are a nation that is depraved. It's become, I have rights, and you will tell me nothing that goes contrary to what I want to do. And in fact, I will call you all kinds of names if you don't accept and believe what I believe is to be right. This is the standard, folks. Not what somebody else thinks or even feels. This is, and our depravity makes it so easy to go any other way other than the way of Scripture. Me, myself, and I, I am the one that really counts. John MacArthur said there are two aspects in this life, humanism and materialism. Humanism places man above all else. Material places everything else above all else. Nowhere is mention of God. And so we live a life that is fulfilling of the lusts of the flesh and of the mind. Our minds are bombarded daily with sex, violence, general disgusting lifestyles that we begin to believe are okay and it's all right to live that way. Because we want, don't want somebody else to think that we're different. We don't want somebody else calling us a name. So we accept it. And it's bad enough that the world generally accepts it. It's worse when the church starts to accept and say, okay, this is what it's okay. I, I know what the word says, but we've got to love. Yes, love does not allow somebody to die in their sins. Love does not say that these things that are going to kill you, your depravity is going to take you to a living hell. Love doesn't say it's okay. Do what you want to do. Depravity says it's okay. Do what you want to do. 
The word trespass speaks so much. The idea of depravity speaks so much to our world today. We see it in every aspect of life. Homosexuality is okay. It's an alternate lifestyle. I'll give folks that. It is an alternate lifestyle. But it's not a godly lifestyle. Oh, you know, abortion's okay. We're not really, we're not really killing anything. You're not? Oh, my goodness. Only those who are being guided by the darkness of this world can possibly take a stand that way. It's simply not biblical, and it's not even, it's not even right. And yet we are guided in that direction. Oh, let me tell you something. I'm really not to blame. I have this sickness, and therefore I drink too much, or I steal continually, or I can't help but, but, but lie. And we put medical terminology on these things to allow man to be able to step back and say, I'm not responsible. Good luck before a holy, righteous God, because we are the responsible. You see, the alcoholic in the eyes of God is called a drunkard, and drunkenness is sin. And our depravity, our depravity makes us say, hey, that's okay, we understand. Well, yeah, we should understand that some people are enslaved to alcohol or anything else. But it's the God of this world. It's the powers that live out there that bring us to think that it's okay to have it in our own lives. Let me tell you something. Human beings in their natural, sp- natural state are depraved. They're dead. They're depraved. And the last word that was used in that quote was doomed. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He says, such were some of you. You were dead in your trespasses sin. You were depraved, living according to things of this world. And you were doomed, having, having nothing to look forward to but the wrath of God. The person who does not know the life-giving effects of God's amazing grace, his wonderful grace, is doomed to an eternity unimaginable in this world. We look at what's going on in the Ukraine. It doesn't even come close. We hear about the persecution of the church in places of Africa and, and, and in Russia and in China. It doesn't even come close, folks, to what the eternal destiny of is of those who don't know this most amazing and wonderful grace. Two verses that help us to start to realize it are found in John chapter 3. Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You don't have to do anything to be condemned. You're already there. Without God, you're dead in your sins. You're depraved to the utmost, and you are doomed for all eternity because you haven't believed the name of the Son of God. And verse 36 of that same chapter goes on and makes it even clearer. It says this, He that believeth on the Son hath hath life, has eternal life. But he that believeth not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abides on him. As you live, the wrath is there. The point of eternity is wrath. We talk about the idea of hell in Scripture, and that is terrible. But the ultimate end is the lake of fire in Revelation. And outside the working of this wonder of grace, Every one of us would be dead in our sins, depraved to the uttermost, and doomed for an eternity, separated from God and under his judgment. Paul, even in these first few verses, makes it so clear that there is a problem. Read Romans chapter 1. There's a problem. Read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a problem. And the problem is the natural nature of man, whom outside of a wonder-working power of God's grace is dead, depraved, and doomed. Not a whole lot being preached these days. Why? Because it gets just like it is in here right now. It gets quiet not politically correct to tell somebody that hey if you don't believe according to this book you're dead you're depraved and you're doomed but the loving thing is to proclaim that because it's in the proclamation and especially in the understanding and the working of the holy spirit to bring faith and to bring conviction that changes everything folks it's the wonder of God's grace that changes absolutely everything in verses four through six and then eight and ten we see what happens when grace is applied 
When grace is applied, there's a quickening. Look, if you would, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he has loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together in Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That Greek word translated quickened means to be made alive together. And whereas we are dead in our trespasses and sin, in Christ by his most wonderful grace, we are made alive. He quickens us. He raises us from the dead. No amens? Let me tell you something. Because of God's great love for us, even when we were sinners, he gives us life, and that life is found in Christ. Romans chapter 5, 8 said, but, but God commended his love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were dead, while we were depraved, while we were doomed, Christ died for you. He died for me. He died for us. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ pays the penalty. It takes us out from under the condemnation. It takes him out us from the wrath of God. And it places us in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And not only that, but in heavenly places. We are resurrected, folks, spiritually from the dead. He makes us alive in Jesus Christ. It's important to realize that it is God who does the quickening because we are dead. Dead in our trespasses and sin. We can do nothing. Wherefore the scripture adds, by grace are you saved. A dead body can do nothing. And therefore it takes this, this wonder of grace doing a work in our lives. In his mercy, which was mentioned in chapter 4, uh, ch uh, verse 4, God does not give us what we deserve. Amen? Amen. He does not give us what we deserve. You know what man deserves? I hear people out on the street, and I listen to conversations on the TV, and I hear the news, and I hear people say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve this. The only thing any of us deserve is condemnation and wrath under God in hell. That's the only thing we deserve. Everything else <laughs> is a plus. God's grace takes us out of that. He doesn't give us wrath and hell. And then this grace, which is mentioned in verse 5, he gives us what we don't deserve, love and eternal life. The work of grace is indeed a wonder. How God would even think of it and why he would even think of it goes beyond our comprehension. But the fact is this. It is by grace that we're saved. For by grace through faith we are saved. Oh, the wonder of grace. We're pictured to be already in the heavenlies in Christ. Here, here's what's such a wonder, and it's hard to understand. But outside of Christ, we're dead. Inside of Christ, we're alive. Why? Because Christ is alive. And if Christ is alive, and he can die no more, then they which are in Christ are what? Alive. By his grace. He lives, and therefore we live. But those who live are those who find themselves inside of Christ, by grace, because of faith. You and I, having come to that point, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You do not save yourself, you cannot save yourself. God does the saving, and he does it by grace when he implants faith into your heart through the hearing of the gospel, according to Romans chapter 10. And in that implanting of faith, we're convicted of our sins, and we bow humbly before God, admitting that, and say, God, I need you to save me because I believe Jesus Christ died from sins, was buried and rose from the dead. Save me, and when we do, by God's grace, he does it with zero works on our behalf. I don't know about you, but that's, I think that's why we use that term amazing grace. Because of what God does. Before grace is applied, we're dead. However, when grace is applied, we're made alive. We're quickened all by God's good mercy and grace. So that we are quickened 
and it goes on beyond that because not only does he quicken us and make us alive, but he doesn't leave us here just to go about our own things. He equips us to do what he wants us to do. He equips us to live in his kingdom. He gives us an understanding. He gives us a guide. He gives us direction so we're not wandering around in a lost land somewhere. His guide is the Holy Spirit of God, which enters into a man once they're saved, or a woman once they're saved, or a child once they're saved. And he becomes the one who teaches, guides, and directs. All because of this wonder of grace. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. God did not take us from death to life just to sit around and veg out with the TV or the computer or go fishing. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to fish. Got the opportunity this week on Monday to do some uh, spoonbill fishing. Had a blast. Found out how just out of shape I was, but I had a blast. But God didn't save me just so I could go do that. God saved me for good works. And not just any good work, but good works which he hath already ordained me to do. I may not know it today, but he might have something for me to do tomorrow, next week, next month. And he has ordained it. I am, I am alive today so I could do what God wants me to do. I am alive today doing what God has called me to do. I was saved on the 18th of November, 1980. I knew nothing about an Old Testament, a New Testament, and Scripture. And in March of that next year, he called me to preach. I had not a clue. But I know this. It's what God called me to do. And I can do all those other things. But that's not what God's called me to do. He has ordained me to good works, and the good works that he's given me to do is to preach the gospel. I can go camping. I can play sports. I can do all those things, but that's not what he's called me to do, called me to do. The question is, what has he called you to do? When God saved you, he called you unto good works, which he already has planned. Are you listening? Are you seeking? Are you desiring to do what God wants you to do? And through it all, the message is very clear. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, those good works which you are foreordained to do. Let them see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How can you know if you're doing the good works that God has ordained you to do? Are they glorifying God? They might be okay, they may not be sinful, they may be okay in the world, but are they glorifying God? And too often we spend so much time in these things that don't glorify God, they're good, they're okay, but they're not what God's called us to do. Churches close their door every single day in the United States of America. Christianity is shrinking every single day in the United States of America. Why is that? I don't know all the reasons, but I can tell you part of it. A lot of people aren't doing what God foreordained them to do and glorify him. We need to have our eyes open. Let your light so shine. Paul wrote, in all things showing my, thyself a pattern of good works, he's speaking to Timothy, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say against you. Excuse me, Titus. God is working. Again, Titus, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable unto men. Might be careful to maintain good works. That phrase means this. You keep your eyes on the goal, on the where you're headed, what you're going to do. God's desire for your life and for his kingdom is that you are constantly seeking to do it. Not getting sidetracked by the things of this world, good or otherwise, but constantly seeking, God, am I doing your will? Am I accomplishing the good works that you have before ordained that I should do. God does not save us by good works, but good works will be followed, will be preceded by our salvation. James says that, 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 a, that a, a, an idea of salvation or, or grace, as we might want to phrase it, 
Listen, he says, without works, it's dead. Why? Because anything that saves us, God's grace, is going to produce the works that he has foreordained. We cannot say, honestly, that I am saved and do absolutely nothing for God. We can speak the words, but folks, it's not, it's not true. Because God saved you with a purpose in mind. Number one purpose is that we go and tell others about Jesus Christ. That is your reason for living. Ultimately, above all things, that we might be a witness to the goodness and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes through salvation in him. That is our purpose for living. That is the goal on which we have to keep our eyes. If God quickened us by faith, then he has a purpose for us fulfilled by faith as well. Are you fulfilling that purpose? You know, eh, well, you know, church is sort of, eh, I have to go, so I go. You know, as far as religion, I don't really care much for religion. And, well, you know, Jesus, this Jesus thing is sort of a personal thing. You really don't need to be pressing on anybody. You don't really need to be trying to confront somebody. I mean, you know, and we back off from it, we give all these excuses. And we think we're living our life okay because we're not committing those big sins. I'm afraid some of us are going to stand before God one day and we'll, though we are not accountable for our sin because he's already paid for that, we're going to be accountable for the works we did or did not do. And so it would behoove all of us to think about the wonder of his grace that saves me, changes me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He changes us, folks. There is, a, there is a fruit that grows out of this bush, and now it's different from what it was before. Our predicament before God, before grace is applied, is that we're dead, deprived, depraved, and doomed. Grace applied means we come into salvation and are set on a path to do the works that God has done and after it is applied once it sort of begins its work in us when it starts to settle in and really ferment so to speak we see God doing a good works verse 7 says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to us through Christ Jesus Paul says listen the ages to come as we move forward day by day month by month year by year decade century millennium the purpose of it all is that, that God might show the exceeding riches of his grace in us, through us, to others. Paul, when he writes, he speaks of these ages to come. I believe it really has a two, two-fold prong, if you want to say it. Number one, he's talking about now, day by day, in this world. God has a purpose for us, and he's going to show forth the goodness and his kindness through us, day by day, through you through me we do that by shining his lights by being and doing God's works before him I think about John Newton's song amazing grace how sweet the sound it saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see you see God changes us through his grace was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear when i first believed it shines into our hearts it changes us it moves us it delivers us from our past and it projects us into the future to glorify him through our good works that grace takes us from the muck and mire of sin and death and places upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ, his righteousness imputed unto us and eternal life. But then there is the ages to come, I think he talked about following his second coming, that eternal outlook. I mean, folks, if you're saved, you have eternal life right now, okay? Now, oftentimes we think about eternal life after we leave this world and, and pass into the heavens, and I guess it's an acceptable way to think about it, but you have it right now, but there is that specialty of standing before God, stepping into his presence, to see him and to acknowledge him where faith becomes sight when i did my dad's funeral i purposely had him leave a chair empty in the front row 
amongst the family. And as I talked to that congregation of about 500, I said, you know, we have an empty chair here and it hurts. It hurts. But that empty chair today is actually by the grace of God. Because now there's a chair in heaven before the throne where he is now seated. Or maybe more important, either standing or bowing, probably more particular. But the fact is, listen, there is, there's an eternal aspect to this, this idea of grace. It's not just here and now. It's not like it's just here to, to give us medicine to help us make it through. It's, it's operating in us and through us to project God's goodness and his glory to the world. But it also is going to end one day when we stand before the presence of a holy, righteous God made complete and true before him. No impurities, no sin, no sickness, no tears, nothing. Absolute glory before God himself. Amen? God's glory revealed in us and through us for all eternity. When I think about grace, I have a tendency to think about that idea of grace. Amazing grace, the next verse was, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We are bound by time in this world. Daily, I'm, I'm bound to think. My dad died at 70 years old. I'm 62. If I'm blessed to make it to my dad's age, I've got eight years. Now, I don't know what that does to you if you thought about that. What it does to me is, though, I've got eight years. If I'm blessed to live that long, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to glorify God with it, or am I going to go try and pass out through all the pleasures of this world so I can go to heaven one day and hear God say, what were you thinking, son? I had these good works all planned for you. All you had to do was submit to me. And, and God, and we would have done these great things together, but you chose to go the way of the world and enjoy its things rather than me. You chose the pleasures of the world for a season rather than the glory of God for eternity. Church, I'm begging you. Live in this world. Enjoy what God has given you. But don't shove him aside for the pleasures because the pleasures of this world are fleeting. I oftentimes think about what God would do if I told our class this morning, I'd like to, I'd like to have a bass boat. And I'm not talking about any bass boat. Man, I, want, I want that $43,000 bass boat that sits in front of Bass Pro. But what would I do with it? Can't afford it. Can't insure it. Don't have the time to get on it. It would sit out in the yard, and oftentimes when I go to uh, Brother Rick's house, there's a little building off there, right? that has got all kinds of boats sitting in there and all kinds of <laughs> decay. That's what it would look like. And though it's okay to fish, and it's all right, and I enjoy doing that, that's not what God called me to do. That's not what I'm going to spend my life doing. Occasionally it's nice to go out there and learn how to, how, how to hit and how to cast and how to snag ow, a paddle uh, spoon bill I'm still sore got a bruise here with that pole hit me Monday but man that's not what he's called me to do folks and that's why I don't find my joy for eternity and I encourage you please don't seek your eternal joy in the things of this world because they're fleeting I had a friend he was a priest in the Catholic Church in uh, Illinois. He had been the priest of that church for 50-something years, and he died. And so I went to his funeral, and uh, as we were walking by the casket, I was probably the third or fourth one back, and there was a group of folks behind me, and they were talking about this, that, and other things of this world, and what this man had done. And I turned and around and I asked him, what's brother and so-and-so taken from this world? I had him in his nice robe. He said, well, I don't know, but he sure had a good time here. I said, yeah, but what's he taking from this world? He's taking nothing. Scriptures tell us we came into this world with nothing and we're leaving with nothing of this world. That's how fleeting these things are. 
And it hit me that day. That was probably 15 years into my ministry. I don't know why it hit me so hard that day, but it hit me that day and said, you know what? That's all I'm taking with me. Now, we can send a lot ahead. <laughs> if we do the good works that God has given us, we're going to stand before him, and there's going to be good works. There's going to be works of gold and silver and the like, and there's going to be hay and stubble, and there's going to be tested by fire, and that which is burnt up is going to be gone. But that which was a pure and an honest, those good works that God ordained, foreordained for us, they're going to withstand. And as we'll talk about tonight, in the parable of the talents, God is faithful to reward, reward his faithful servants. So I want to close with this parallel I see. In verse 7 we read, to the exceeding riches of his glory. In chapter 1 we read, to the praise of his glory. I honestly believe that the exceeding riches of his grace will be to the praise of his glory. As God works in me, as he works in you, to build his kingdom, to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to allow our good works to be a light that glorifies him, that will be to the praise of his glory. And one day, we'll stand before the Lord. And we will stand before the Lord to the praise of his glory because of his grace that wonderful grace this morning I ask you first and foremost do you know Jesus Christ as your savior without him you might feel fine life might be going well and you got the houses and the cars and the boats and the side by sides and the four liter wheelers and the rifles and the bows and you may have all that you might have a house that you've got decorated to the hilt with antiques and it all looks just marvelous but the day you take your last breath none of it matters the only thing that matters is what the grace of the lord jesus christ has done in your life if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, I beg you to humble yourself, admit that you're a sinner, believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, and by faith, because you can't see Christ, but by faith, believing the word that has endured the ages, believing what it says, ask Christ to save you, and folks, he will. Titus tells us that God who cannot lie promised before the world began. Listen, Christ will save you this morning. Christian, hear me. Life can be hard. We endure things sometimes we never thought imaginable. We go places we would never have thought about going. I think about my brothers and sisters at, at arms, 20 years in the service, the places have been never thought and imaginable. But God's grace brings you through it. God's grace brings you through it because you believe in a sovereign God who loves you and cares for you and has said that he'll use all things, all things work together for good. He didn't say all things were good, but they work together for good. And he can use you, no matter how broken you might think you are, God can use you to the praise of his glory because of this most wondrous grace. God's grace at work in you. Just ask him to do it. Maybe you need somebody to come alongside of you and help you. I'm here. I'm sure you have friends in the church. Seek that godly counsel. Ask them to be there for you. Encourage you and lift you up. Make them prayer partners. Allow them to speak into your life. Even when you think it's harsh or you think it's bad, let them speak into your life that God's grace might do a wonderful work and that you might indeed abound to the praise of his glory. Let's bow our heads this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we think about the exceeding riches of your grace. I pray this morning that if there's one in our midst here, one that has joined us by way of the internet, possibly anywhere around the world, 
I pray, God, that if they don't know Christ as their Savior, this would be the moment, this would be the time, this would be the accepted day that your Holy Spirit might take the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and pour out your grace upon them, bringing conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and that, God, they would bow before you humbly, admitting they need, they need Christ because they're sinners. They are under condemnation and going to see wrath, and so they lift up their hands with nothing in them but to say, God, save me. And, Father, I pray that you'll do that. And in so doing, you'll give them confidence, strength, boldness, in the gospel of Christ, that they might get up from that point, walking forward to do the works that you have ordained, that they might show the riches of your grace to a world that is so much in need. Father, this morning we ask that your spirit will do a work we cannot do, that he will convince those that we cannot convince, and that he'll save them that we cannot save. God, may you do a work that it will amaze us and help us to step back and just see the wonder of your grace. And Father, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to encourage us. We stand. We're going to sing an invitational hymn. It's, t- it's just a time for you to do what God's spoken to your heart about. Maybe, maybe you need to be saved. You can come forward and say, Pastor, I want to get saved. We'll sit down with Scripture and show you. And you can make that confession and profession to Christ. Maybe you're here this morning. Having been saved, you need to be baptized. Uh, that's that real first act of obedience uh, it doesn't hurt um, if the heater's not working it might be a little cold but it's all right you're in and out but it's it shows you being obedient to our lord jesus christ and is a picture of what god's already done in your life how you were raised from the dead uh, in in christ maybe you're here this morning you've accepted christ you've been baptized um, if you've been through our newcomers class and god wants you and spoke to your heart about being a member you can come forward and say pastor i want to present myself for membership if you have not been through the class, you can still come forward and say, Pastor, I want to be a member, and we'll get you scheduled for that. Uh, our constitution requires that you go through. It's a three-hour uh, three program that's over three Sundays. I want to encourage you. It helps you to see who we are, what we're doing, what it's about, so there's no surprises. So we encourage you to take that step as well. During this invitation, if God's spoken to your heart, please be obedient and follow him, and you will be to the praise of his glory. In Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and sing this first verse together. <laughs> so doing it just gets snatched up so god spoke to your heart about salvation asking to save you right now if he spoke to you about your need for baptism come forward and say pastor i need to be baptized right now maybe he's spoken to you about your need for joining the church if he has now's the time to do that you see god is working in our midst god is doing a work that only he knows in its entirety and we are blessed to be a part of that so this morning, we're going to sing another verse. If God spoke to your heart, I want to encourage you to come forward, and uh, we'll see where God takes us from there. As we sing the second verse, you be obedient to him, and you follow his will. Praise the Lord. Let's just honor him. Here we go. Precious 
One of the uh, wonderful things that I get to do as a pastor <coughs> is to talk to people about Christ. I sort of get a time slot every week to do that, so it's a good thing. And uh, baptize. And uh, the other thing is to welcome folks into the church. And we've uh, God's been working in the life of the church, and we're glad to see him uh, moving on people's lives. So I want to introduce some folks to you. And um, all of these uh, have been in our, in our class uh, for new members. Uh, I've spoken with them about their salvation, and we've talked to them about baptism. So as they come forward, I'm just going to have them stand here, and then when we get all here, I'm just going to call. Our Constitution says that once they've been through the class and we know where they're at and where they're from, that we can just vote on that. And so we're going to do that this morning. So uh, Larry and Glenda, come on up here. I met these folks almost two, almost almost three years. Yeah. Uh, when Glenn's mom, uh, mom died, and it was, a, it was just an opportunity to talk with them. And so I'm so glad to see them becoming a part of this fellowship. And we pray that we can be a church that will encourage and strengthen you in your walk. Okay, so also, uh, George, coming up here. George is really the newest of the uh, three groups that are up here. Uh, George uh, moved, uh, moved, uh, is moving his membership uh, from down in Branson. And so he and his wife have got some land right out here on, is it Green? Green green road so praise the lord for that so we want to encourage them as he comes and uh thank you for following the lord's wisdom and direction and then greg come on up here along with your wife and daughter <coughs> um you know they um uh, linda and logan and them have been coming i don't know a year and a half about a year and uh we are so glad to see them uh follow the lord's direction in this and and I pray that we can be an encouragement to them and you as well, Logan. I know you're a senior this year? I'll be a senior. Senior, senior next year. And so praise God. We, we'll we just uh, see what we can do to build up Christ in their lives as well. So as I've said, all of them uh, saved, baptized, all of them have been through our new members class. And so in accordance with our Constitution, I bring them before you. And all in favor of accepting them into the membership of First Baptist Church Sparta, say amen. amen. All opposed? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. No opposition. If you all just sit in the front pew, as soon as we're done, I'm going to have you come up and let them shake your hand and let you know. All right. Do we have any uh, any announcements? I know we have some. All right. Fundamentals, basics for Christians. A class we started today that I'm teaching. Uh, it basically goes into just uh, the fundamentals of Christianity. We talked about prayer today. We're going to be talking about uh, quiet time next week. If you'd like to be a part of that, please let me know, and we'll get you in there so I can get you the material. Uh, but it's eight weeks, and just we're going to be talking about Bible study. We'll be talking about just all kinds of things that are just basically the foundation for our Christian walk. So if you'd like to do that, let me know. Yes, I hear that voice. Uh, Baccalaureate coming up uh, Wednesday, May 11th at the high school. Praise God for that. Uh, it's been... I am I am feeling blessed because in our la my last church they didn't have it there and I was there 19 years and so 
this will be a wonderful time just to gather with seniors and just lift up the name of Christ. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it will be at the high school. So we'll have no services here that Wednesday night. Graduation Sunday, May 15th. It's just a time for us to acknowledge our, our folks who are graduating. Um, most of our high school graduates, I know. But you may be graduating with an under, under, undergraduate degree or maybe your graduate degree or post after that. Uh, if you're graduating, let me know. Um, it's always a joy to, to rejoice with those. Uh, if, for those of you who don't know, my daughter uh, will be graduating this uh, coming uh, month. And we're in Mary this month uh, with her PhD from Baylor. And so it's a, a goal finally met that I've been pushing her at. And I know she's glad to be done so she doesn't have to hear from me. But if there's others, we want to be able to congratulate them as well. VBS, May 22nd through 26th. Praise the Lord, all the, all the teaching spots are filled, amen, praise God. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, please let us know. Do we still have the sign-up sheet out there for folks to let us know if they want to help? Does anybody know? Okay, if it's not up there, you can come see me, we'd love to have you. 22nd to 26th, and if you don't sign up, if you'll come, uh, we'd love to help you, have you work. However, if you're going to work with kids, you do have to have a background investigation that we need to do. So if you want to help, let us know, and we'll get that ran. It's no cost to you and then you'll be able to do that. We're going to be having our first uh, VBS canvassing uh, May 15th, uh, yeah, May 15th at 6 p.m. We'll meet here at the church, and then we'll go out and hand out flyers in the community. If we don't get it done or if we're rained out, then we've got May, what's the other, the other date? 18th. The 18th. Uh, so be, be ready for that, and let's get the word out to our community. Here's summer camps coming up. Radio Bible camps, the first one, starting May 31st. Uh, I don't know what all the deadlines are, but most of the next three are all camps for, uh, that we put on at Southern Baptist. You can find the information, the paperwork. Crystal, can you get that to them if they want it, or they already do? Okay. Okay, today or no later than Wednesday for those, for those uh, camps. Uh, Haiti Mission Yard Sales coming up on June uh, 2nd through the 4th. It'll be, if you're headed down 14, there's uh, Ozark... Uh, um, vet on the left as you're headed uh, west right across the street there we had it there uh, last year it did well I want to encourage you to come out if you see somebody else's stuff you want go ahead and buy it and uh, help the uh, crew get ready for their Haiti trip which is coming up and that date is now passed as far as being able to join right um, I need to know the date because I'm looking at the okay Okay, so if you want to go to Haiti today, you need to know because we need to get those reservations in, and you can talk to Andy right here. All right, so we have those mission trips coming up. Men on Mission on June 11th through 18th is a sign-up. Okay, okay, so if you want to do Men on Missions and you sign up by next Sunday, the sign-up sheet's out in the foyer. Uh, that's 11th through the 18th. Haiti trip is 6th through the 13th. Then we have a youth trip, which is already full and already in full 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 planning mode through the 17th to 23rd be in prayer for our youth as they go and the ones that are going with them envelope fundraiser for missions um, there are a number of things uh, that you can do we have uh, these are are out on there on the wall uh, you can put in mission donations for Haiti uh, and missions donation and this is for the youth right for the youth uh, there's also a board as you go out these doors and take a left there's a board with a lot of envelopes on there with dollar amounts if you would like to give to either one of these, you can pull that envelope off, put the money in it of what it says, uh, $20, 30 whatever, and you can stick it in that wood box that sits out here, and right, stick it in the box. You, you don't want them hanging it back up, do you? Okay, yeah, just stick it in the box out there. Uh, you can do that any as you come through, and so we're trying to get all these mission trips lined out, get them financed, and then get the folks in the air or in the vehicles and get them gone and see what God will do for his glory with them. Ladies' prayer breakfast, June 5th, it's at 8.30. Bring you this to share. There will be ladies that will be in this room right here. New Sunday class, Sunday school class for college and career begins June 5th. Uh, if you are graduating from high school this year or already have graduated over the last five, six, seven years or so, really want to get this going for you. So I want to encourage you to come on out. Uh, we've got teachers lined up, the room's set up, and so everything's ready to go. We just need you to show up. So we want to be able to just meet your need as a, as a young adult. Anything else? Adult, new adult series, Share Your Faith, beginning May 15th. Is that in your class? Okay, that, is that still being video? Okay, that'll be uh, video driven. Uh, so that is on Sunday morning. So come on out if you want to learn how to share your faith and get stronger in that area.
Help wanted, we have openings in Sunday school teachers, nursery, and we will have one for the sixth through eighth grade. If you would like to teach in that area, please see me or see Tyler. I saw you. Where are you at, Tyler? Did he just leave? Oh, he's in the back. Tyler's back there. See him uh, and let them know. Okay, or see head of the Sunday school department, <laughs> Paul. So uh, let them know so they can uh, work on that. All right, transportation committee survey. Uh, we did have a few announcements today. Uh, if you would like or if you have or want to or be willing to get a Class E license, we'd like to know that. Uh, that's for a possible um, van or people carry that we are considering. You just sign up on the sheet. It's right out here on the right side as you're leaving the, uh, uh, the sanctuary. Last thing is a part of our worship time. Uh, we, still we still give as a part of our worship. You can do that in a number of ways, and that is to the general fund of the church uh, for his work. Uh, you can give by mailing it in. You can give by downloading Tithely app. Giving that way, you can go through the app or through our uh, website or mail it in or drop it off. So if God is uh, speaking to you about your tithing and giving, uh, please see that you do that as you glorify and honor him. Is that it? Praise the Lord. I know y'all are happy. So I'll stand and we'll close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, for the wonder of your grace, how it impacts our lives to bring us to Christ, and how afterwards it, it moves in our life to help us to serve you and to do those works that you have ordained. And so I pray for each one that is a part of this body of Christ, that you would help us to consider what it is you have for us to do, and that, God, we'd do it. Father, for those who are visiting, thank you for having them come. I pray that they were encouraged through your word, and I pray, God, your Holy Spirit will lead, guide, and direct. And for those that are lost, uh, here or by way of the Internet, we pray, God, that you'll just speak to their heart about their greatest need, and that is for Christ. So thank you for the day. Give us safety throughout. Father, we pray for those coming back tonight that we'll be able to learn about how we use uh, those talents and gifts that you give us. Father, thank you for all that you've done in our lives, and may we glorify you, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have these folks just step up here. Come on.